To begin, we've asked each of these gentlemen to start by laying the groundwork from their own perspective. And take 10 minutes or so, each of you, if you don't mind, and let's have more or less an opening statement from each of you. And I'll start with you, Dr. Lutzer. First of all, I want to say that both Eric and I realize that parallels between Nazi Germany and America can be easily overdrawn. So we're not here tonight to call someone a Nazi, but it is interesting that there are certain streams in our culture that do parallel Nazi Germany, and those, I'm sure, during the course of this evening are going to be highlighted. I've given uh, here three or four characteristics of the church, which I would like to just uh, explain to you so that you have a context in which this discussion will take place. First of all, of course, we mentioned the economy. After World War I, you have the experience of Germany being saddled with war debt. And uh, as a result of that, they printed a lot of money to pay their debt. The Treaty of Versailles demanded that they pay the debt. What happened was you had rampant inflation. It was totally out of control. And uh, so there were soup lines in Munich and in Berlin and other countries. So it was a time of desperation when the mark fell in value until I think it took four billion marks or something like that to make an American dollar. And in the midst of this, there was such chaos because the Weimar Republic, which had begun after World War I, which was Germany's first experience of democracy, had totally failed. There were many different parties, and as a result, it was stalled, and so Germany was looking for a leader. You should never believe the devil, but I think that he was probably right in the book of James when he said, all that a man has, he gives for his life. So the German people said, we're giving up our freedoms in exchange for bread. Hitler, of course, had the Reichstag burned, and as a result of that, blamed it on the communists, and people were desperate, and they were looking for a strong leader and Hitler was their man. So first of all, we mentioned the economy, and at first Hitler was able, after 1929, you have that big collapse, he was able to put Germany back to work, build uh, the Volkswagen, begin the Autobahn, and he had a tremendous number of successes. And the Germans were euphoric regarding Hitler, who at last was giving them some stability as a country. Secondly, what you have is nationalism. It's impossible to explain the German church to those of us who know the separation of church and state, but nationalism has always been rife in Germany, certainly fueled, in a sense, even by Martin Luther, who we, whom we might have an opportunity to talk about tonight and his contribution to nationalism. It's been my privilege to lead tours to the sites of the Reformation at least a half dozen times. I always take the people to the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedenkskirche. That's German, you know. I always say that um, German is the only language in which you can say I love you and it sounds like a threat. Uh, ich liebe dich. Really? Do you want to settle that out in the hall? Let's go up there and take care of it. In the Kaiser Wilhelm Church, you see reliefs of the Kaiser leading people to Christ. So it was almost like the divine right of kings. It was the Kaiser who was leading the church. In World War I, when soldiers died, it was believed that their death, they were martyrs for Christ. I have at home a belt buckle, a Nazi belt buckle that someone sent me, with a cross of Christ in the center. And so the churches bought into this nationalism, and whatever was good for Germany was good for the church. It's impossible to overemphasize this. And when the confessing church began, which we may have an opportunity to refer to tonight, when Bonhoeffer and Neil Niemöller began the Pastors Emergency League and then the confessing church, the confessing church, which was the evangelical wing standing against Hitler, eventually wimped out. They wimped out when one of Hitler's cronies said for his 50th birthday, we want every pastor in Germany to swear personal allegiance to Hitler. And you know, that convention did not take a stand against that. They said Romans 14, excuse me, Romans 13, obey the powers that be. They are ordained of God. They said every pastor can make up his own mind. And you know, the pastor swore personal allegiance and those didn't were rounded up by Hitler's Gestapo. Hitler loved the fact that the church was not unified on that point. 
But many of the pastors said, we have to sign it or we are unpatriotic. So Bonhoeffer, and Eric, of course, here being an expert on Bonhoeffer, will speak to the fact that the church in Germany could never quite figure out whether they should bow before the cross of Christ or before German nationalism, sometimes not realizing that these were incompatible, but there was a synthesis between Germanism and also Christianity, and that has huge implications. Let me give you a third characteristic of the church, and that is it was part of what I call a cultural stream, cultural euphoria. Hitler in Mein Kampf laid out his theory of uh, propaganda. He, of course, said that uh, a big lie is always better than a little one, and if you tell it often enough, people will believe it. And because of his successes, both at home and as a foreign policy man, the nation was euphoric. People would go to Nuremberg, where the great rallies were, and they'd come back saying, Our Father who art in Nuremberg, the Third Reich, come. I had a woman say to me, You Americans will never understand the euphoria and the electric power of Hitler to be able to pull things off. So here's the point that is very critical. In the culture, there was so much pressure to believe that Hitler was doing the right thing. Hitler believed that if you had this cultural stream that was powerful enough, nobody would stand against you, and if they did, they would be quiet because everybody's to fall in line. There was this great suspension of judgment just like there is in America today, a suspension of judgment and unwillingness to stand against the current. And as a result of that, the church became a part of that tremendous amount of pressure. Propaganda was huge. When Hitler starved children, he called it putting them on a low-calorie diet. When it came to killing the Jews, it was cleansing the land. Hitler made the famous statement, truth is not important. It's not necessary, but winning is. And so, as a result, the German people were caught up in this, and the church was caught up in it too, enamored by the glories of Hitler. Let me give you one last characteristic, and that is the loss of the gospel. In Germany, this is huge, and I have no doubt that God judged the country because, first of all, you have philosophers such as Hegel, I found Hegel's grave in Berlin one day when I had some extra time, happened to be walking across the cemetery where he's buried. But his whole idea of, of relativism, of the dialectic, you have Nietzsche who proclaimed the death of God and said, we have killed him, who will wipe the blood from our hands, preparing the way for Hitler. Hitler was a great fan of Nietzsche, had his picture taken at the Nietzsche statue in Weimar often, etc., but here's the point, not just the philosophers and their nihilism, but also the theologians. You can go to Berlin University, Humboldt University as it is called today, and there you have, of course, the greats who were there, Schleiermacher, who lived before Hitler, destroying the Christian faith in his own philosophy and theology. Then you have Bultmann, who demythologized the New Testament, took out all the miracles, and the German people were left with a church that was totally powerless because they didn't even have the basic gospel. I have to say it in love, but they had lost it, and America's losing it too. Maybe we'll get an opportunity to talk about that. One last thing. When I was in Wittenberg, where Luther nailed his 95 theses to the castle church door, in the castle church in Wittenberg, I stayed for a Gottesdienst, that's a German service at noon, because I understand some German. And the man, the pastor, read from the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Quran, and said that in this church we honor all three of the world's great religions. And Luther is buried just about 20 feet from where he was standing. That's the church in Germany. It was ripe for a takeover by false philosophy. I'm anxious to come back and talk about all those things, really important points, and uh, we need to spend some time on each and every one of them. It could be a whole program, actually, or a whole evening sure could on be, each, yeah. each one, but as time permits. Eric, welcome to Moody Church, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. 
and I'm going to speak in English from now on. Uh, thank you um, for being here. I thought you here. were mad at me I'm, there for I'm, a I'm moment. Moved. So. <laughs> Uh -huh. I know, it's the problem with, with German. Um, uh, really, uh, Pastor Lutzer almost said word for word everything I was going to say in my opening statement. Uh, oh, we have more time then. Because, uh, I, mean, I mean, most people know that I, I helped him write his statement, and uh, it's no coincidence, but I should have... Uh, it is funny, though, for me, quite honestly, to, to be with someone who knows so much about these things and who very humbly makes it sound like I know more. I, I, I don't think that I do. Um, Pastor Lutzer has, has written two books uh, that talk about the parallels and so on and so forth and has years and years of study on this. I, I'm fairly new uh, to this whole thing, and that's not all bad. Sometimes being new to something gives you a fresh perspective. Um, when I wrote the Bonhoeffer book, um, I was mostly ignorant of Bonhoeffer, and I think that that brings, you bring something um, that's very different from what a scholar brings, namely ignorance. And, uh, <laughs> and yet, the, the upside of ignorance is that when you learn things, you're astounded and surprised. It's not, oh, I've heard it a million times before. And so, my job really was only to tell the story of Bonhoeffer, but in, in the course of telling the story of Bonhoeffer, and in, in the course of doing all this research, with no history on my own of knowing any of these things, uh, it, it came to me afresh and many times stunned me and shocked me because I had some vague idea about something and then I realized I, I, I was totally wrong about that. For example, um, I don't, don't want to get into this too much now, but th there's this um, wrong idea abroad for, it's been, a, it's been out there for uh, 50 years, that Bonhoeffer was theologically liberal, uh, especially toward the end of his life when he, you know, wrote about religionless Christianity and so on and so forth. And I was absolutely shocked to realize that that's, that's entirely untrue. I, I was stunned because you think, who, who am I when you have all these scholars? But I talked about this a little bit um, last night at the Christian Heritage uh, Academy at an event. But I was astounded by so many things. But the thing that I was astounded by which concerns us tonight, was the parallels between what I saw happening, you know, mainly in the, in the 30s, but also in the 20s in Germany, and, and things that are happening today. I did not expect to find these things. A lot of people maybe thought, well, I wrote the book to underscore these things because somebody needed to make the point. I was unable to make the point because I was myself unaware of the point. I was simply telling the story, and in the course of telling the story, uh, reading all this information, which kept making me think, my goodness, this sounds very familiar. This is strange. Uh, this sounds very familiar. This is strange. Now, the main parallel, if we're going to talk about parallels, and we, we are and we should, has to do with this issue of religious freedom. Now, I will say this again. I'm very happy to confess my ignorance. Um, when it came to the issue of religious freedom, religious freedom was something that my hero and friend Chuck Colson was always talking about. That was about all I knew about religious freedom. The concept exactly, when somebody said, what is religious freedom, I, I wasn't sure. Um, but in the course of writing the Bonhoeffer book, I began to learn what religious freedom is. And in fact, it's because of Chuck Colson uh, that I was able to see some of these parallels. Um, religious freedom, just to put the foundation here for us, the, the founders of this great republic understood that at the very heart of all the liberties uh, in this American experiment, this fragile American experiment, uh, which can wither and die at any moment, it's fragile, needs tending, um, at the heart of this is this thing called religious freedom. Th this country was founded by people who had fled Europe specifically because of lack of religious freedom, right? Now, most of us are incredibly ignorant about this. Why? Because we've had nothing but religious freedom. How do you even know what it is? It's like talking about polio. You ask a 20-year-old about polio. What? What's polio? <laughs> it's been eradicated. So you don't even know what it is. Well, problems with religious freedom have, es have essentially been eradicated in our world until very recently. But we have grown up with so much religious freedom because the founders understood how important it was and they said the government must never interfere with the church the government must never establish a church. That's a key 
thought, establish a church, right? It doesn't mean that the government is meant to be secular. A lot of people talk about uh, separation of church and state as though that means the government is supposed to be secular. That is, it is vile nonsense. Could I put it in stronger terms without cursing? I don't think so. Um, it's absurd that the government is meant to be somehow secular. That's just simply not true. You can say I don't agree with it, but the fact is that's what the founders meant. You can disagree with them, but that's what they meant. That the government is supposed to take a pro-church attitude, a pro-religious attitude, a pro, but never to take sides and to say everybody in Massachusetts must be Baptist or everybody in Georgia must be Congregationalist. Or never to take sides, to be agnostic in the true sense of the word when it comes to religious freedom, to say we're going to let the free market of ideas decide. The people will decide. They can go to any church they like. They can go to no church. They can curse God. They can love God. They can be Muslim. They can be Jewish. They can do what they like. This is the United States of America, and we are going to trust that freedom and truth will reign. We're going to trust the free market of ideas, okay, the invisible hand of that free market to deliver the best ideas that people can vote as they like and do as they like. Um, and so that concept of religious freedom was so enshrined by the founders uh, that we've had it in spades. So when I was reading the story of Bonhoeffer, I began to see that in Germany, they pretty much had religious freedom but when Hitler suddenly becomes the head of the state, he began to bully the churches, began to push the churches and, and tell them, well, you can't do this and you can't do that. Just like the American church, they were so unused to having problems with the government that they didn't know what to make of it. It, it didn't compute because they thought, we've always had a wonderful relationship between the church and state. In fact, just as Pastor Lutzer was saying, the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche, I just wanted to say that, uh, the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche has, uh, it was bombed to smithereens by the Allies, not quite to smithereens, but it's a busted hulk of a, of a church now. And of course the Germans left it up as a heavy handed symbol, uh, modernistic symbol of, you know, peace. War is bad, like in case we didn't know. And so they left it there. But you go inside and as the, the Pastor Lutzer said, there are these mosaics. And you can see the cozy relationship between the church and state, so cozy that when I went in there, it made me really uncomfortable. You see the ermine-clad Kaiser, Wilhelm, and then you see Jesus. And, you know, it, it would be no different than walking in here and seeing George Bush and Jesus or Obama and Jesus. You'd say, nah, that's, not, that's not good. You better do something about that. We know that that's, we should know that that's dangerous. But they didn't know. And so the separation of church and state didn't really exist in Germany. It was a cozy relationship between the church and the state. And it didn't work out so badly because the Kaiser was basically pro-church and so on and so forth. Until the head of the state was not the Kaiser, but Adolf Hitler. And the moment Adolf Hitler assumed the leadership of the German state, he felt, and many Germans didn't argue with this, that the state encompasses everything, including the church. The German church is part of the German state, no different than the post office or the motor vehicles or what the tax department. The church is just a part of the German state. Now, again, if you've grown up where the church and the state are that cozy, you don't really see a problem with that. I mean, my mother's German and my father's Greek. In Greece, everybody's Greek Orthodox, quote unquote. In Russia, everybody's Russian Orthodox, quote, unquote. You know, in France and Italy, everybody's Catholic, quote, unquote. Really? No. But it's this nationalistic blurring. And so in Germany, the church and the state were together, and suddenly Hitler comes in and he says, I am the state, and I'm going to tell you. And so he starts pushing the church. And really, Bonhoeffer uniquely uh, saw what was happening, and we'll talk about this tonight, and saw the role of the church is to stand against the state and to say to the state, wait a minute, we are separate from you. We answer to God first. Romans 13 has its limits, as does every verse in scripture. You read the whole of the scripture, right? I don't think, you know, uh, Daniel was down with Romans 13. You know, he didn't bow to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar in case we skip that. That's in the Old Testament, by the way. Um, <laughs> Daniel was a good guy. Uh, so. These things are complicated, and Bonhoeffer somehow was able to see that 
the state now is pushing the church and the church better recognize it and better stand up. And these are the parallels that I see in our country today. You can make too much of it, but you can certainly make too little of it. And I think mostly we're making too little of it. And we need to really understand what is happening. And I'll say this finally, because a principle is, is a big deal, a principle, right? It's not about how far did you cross over the line. It's that you crossed over the line. So when you tell people that they have to use their money to pay for insurance that covers something that their church considers immoral, you, you, you have to understand we're crossing a line when the government is pushing people to do something. Uh, and there are all kinds of little examples, but the littlest example is nonetheless the crossing of a line. And then there's another little example and another little example and another little example, and before you know it, you've gone way over the line. And that's exactly what happened in Germany Tiny law by tiny law by tiny law, and it, they made it more and more difficult for the church to be the church. Thank you. And mm -hmm. I want both of you to know that I hope you won't just address your questions to each other through me. I want the two of you talking to each other tonight. So, Dr. Lutzer, if you want to pick up on any of those points, go, go, go ahead. Yeah, I ahead. do. You know, one of the things that Hitler did, interestingly, is when he nominated Ludwig Mueller to be the head of the church, and that was done in Luther's church in Wittenberg, too, by the way. Bonhoeffer and Niemöller were there, and Bonhoeffer said to Niemöller, you are now witnessing the death of the church in Germany. Uh, Mueller gave a muzzling decree and the Muslim decree said this, the church should preach the pure gospel and nothing else. In my book, I tell the story of a train that had uh, the train track near a church, and the pietists were having their Bible studies, and when the train rumbled by, they sang more loudly because they knew that that train was full of Jews on their way to a concentration camp. So you see, as long as the people had their Bible studies only, Hitler didn't care. He never discouraged anyone from going to church as long as it didn't mean anything and impinge upon his authority. And so that's the way Hitler worked, and he co-opted the church. You know, Wayne, I was going to tell a story earlier that I think really isolates exactly what we're talking about today. When um, Martin Niemöller went to see Hitler along with uh, other pastors because Hitler was finding it harder to crush the church than he thought. He expected them to all buy in, and there was opposition. Hitler shouted at them, all that I want is peace. All that I want is peace. You can have your doctrines, but I want peace. And then he said, you take care of the church, and I'll take care of the German people. When Niemöller shook hands with Hitler, he chose his words very carefully, and he said, you said that we should take care of the church, you take care of the German people, but God has also given us a responsibility to the German people, and that will not be taken away from us. Hitler turned away without a word. He was so angry. And by then, the pastor's emergency league had been begun by Niemöller and Hitler. It had 6,000 signatures. 2,000 immediately removed their names because they thought that Niemöller should not have been that upfront with Hitler. He should have been more compromising. And uh, Niemöller's uh, study was bombed and so forth. But the point still stands. What is the relationship of the church to the state and the controlling realities? We believe also in the pure gospel. But the question is, is that what we should be doing in isolation? Or should we be involved in the controlling realities of our time? Yeah, I want to, um, gosh, there's so much good stuff here. First of all, uh, I want to say this, that uh, in the meeting between Niemöller and Hitler, I, I, I write about it in my book, Bonhoeffer, because it was, it was a big deal meeting. And Niemöller at this point, just so you understand, he was a very patriotic German and a very pro-Nazi German. This was early enough that many, many, many good people had no idea where Hitler was taking Germany. And you have to understand that. Many good people didn't know. Niemöller was one of those good people. He was a World War I hero. And so he goes into this meeting believing that uh, there are people in Hitler's government who are the troublemakers. And, and the people who are uh, Bishop uh, um, Muller, uh, the sort of bullet-headed uh, 
I don't know, athletic chaplain. He he's, comes across as a comic figure, I think, in, in my book, Ultimately Tragic. But, but it, they're the problem. They're trying to Nazify the church. Niemöller thought, Hitler, he, he, he's, not, he's a good guy. If we can only get to him, he's going to be reasonable. So they go into this meeting. The meeting begins, I think it was Goebbels read a transcript of Niemöller's tele, uh, telephone conversation. If you want to get somebody's attention that uh, you've got them cornered, right? So they read some things that he said, which were not very nice, whatever, just to sort of play that game with him. And anyway, at some point, there's this, this uh, back and forth where Niemöller tries to reassure Hitler that we care about the Third Reich. Don't, don't misunderstand us, Fuhrer. And he says, we, we, I care about the Third Reich. I, you know, in other words, I'm with you. We're only talking about this church issue. I'm with you. And that's where... Hitler snaps at him and says, you just worry about your sermons. I built the Third Reich, right? Now, this is an interesting teaching point because if you think of the church as this, this little thing, right? You go into this little building and you do your little stuff and then you come out and it's over, right? You worry about your little meaningless sermons. I built the Third Reich. In other words, the moment those sermons are not meaningless, it threatens the government, right? So Hitler had this idea, and many people have this idea, and unfortunately many Christians have this idea, that the gospel has to be contained, right? Well, if the gospel is contained, it's not the gospel. Don't be fooled. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Uh, that was, that's a quote from the favorite philosopher of George W. Bush, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. Not many, not many people got that. I'll, I'll stick to more contemporary references for the group. I know it's a young group. Um, so uh, anyways, Justin Bieber said last week, I think. Um, but, but the idea that you can contain the gospel, it's not the gospel. But there are many people who say, well, we just want to preach the gospel. We don't want to get political. We don't want to talk about, for example, same-sex marriage. We don't want to talk about Obamacare or the HHS. Because you know what? It's so complicated, number one, but it's, it gets political. And I just want to win souls for Christ. Well, what do you want to win them to? What kind of church, what kind of toothless, spineless church do you want to win those people to? Right? And that's exact. well, if... If you're really suffering, you don't want that kind of, you don't want that to be the church. So I guess my, my real point here is that what that view is, that's called freedom of religion. I'm sorry, that's called freedom of worship, not freedom of religion. I actually think Hillary Clinton about three years ago, I don't know if she knew it or not, but she talked about freedom of worship. Freedom of worship, they've got that in China in spades, okay? It means you go into that building at a certain time, you do your little silly mumbo-jumbo mystical rituals, and then when you come out, you bow to the secular authority of the state. That's freedom of worship, quote-unquote. Meaningless, weasel words. Freedom of religion, given to us by the founders, enshrined in our Constitution, means when you leave the building, you can and must boldly exercise your faith in every sphere. That is not only what the Constitution guarantees, but it's what the founders said, it's the genius at the heart of America. If we do not have that happening, it's over. And so that's exactly what Hitler was trying to do, push the church into a little religious corner and say, yeah, it's fine, you be religious, but everything else is ours. That's the antithesis of the gospel. And, you know, I was in uh, China in uh, 1985, I think it was. Very interesting, Eric. We talked about the freedom of religion to the tour guide who was guiding us. You know what she said? We have freedom of religion in China. People can be as religious as they want to be within their own minds. In other words, if you want to be religious right. within your minds, you have that freedom. Right. You know, when this controversy was on the news about whether or not a Christian baker has to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding couple, I heard somebody on the news say, well, those Christians can have their views, but why don't they just keep those views within the church? So that's the whole thing. In other words, as long as you are within the church and you have those views, that's fine because it's toothless, to use a very good word that I heard someone use quite recently. And uh, that's the issue at stake. Wayne, I think that this might be appropriate for me since we are, we're hopping into the deep end of the swimming pool pretty soon in That's this fine. discussion. We want you to. 
because Eric mentioned something that I want to, that I've thought about among my evangelical friends. What you have is two different views of the relationship of the church and the controlling realities. You have many of them who say we preach only love, we're to serve our communities, we are not to be judgmental. If we preach about same-sex marriage, what will happen is we'll turn people off whom we want to win to Christ, and therefore our view is love, all of our sermons are positive, we cherry-pick passages of scriptures that are positive, so that um, we have this very welcoming atmosphere. And I think we should have a welcoming atmosphere. That's not the debate. On the other hand, you have those who definitely have politicized the gospel. And I think sometimes we've done that in very unfortunate ways where Christianity is identified with a Republican Party. And, and there's, uh, for example, I as a pastor would never, under any condition, endorse a political candidate because of various reasons because uh, I think that the cross has to be above all political candidates. We say to Democrats, to Republicans, and to independents, all of you are going to hell unless you believe on Jesus. That's the message that we have to maintain and we keep separate. So there are those that politicize the gospel. And today what's happened in our society, because we've seen some bad examples of that, what you have is especially younger evangelicals, the 40-40 divide. If you're over 40, you understand the importance of these things. If you're under 40, you are brought up watching Will and Grace and other uh, television shows, and so you're not concerned about all of these issues. But I think it is so important for us to find a middle way, and I'm using the phrase these days, redemptive involvement, in our culture. Both of those words are important. We have to do it redemptively, but we have to have the kind of involvement that actually touches our culture. One other thought while I still have the microphone, and that is that, uh, you know, those who say we could never speak against same-sex marriage in our church because we'd be turning off those whom we want to win to Christ, it dawned on me one day, Wayne and Eric, whenever I have a new thought, I mean, that's huge. When the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans, he knew it would be read out loud to the church in Rome because most people couldn't read in those days. And look at what he was saying about homosexuality. So Paul was not quite as sensitive as some of our seeker-sensitive friends who say we can never speak about these kinds of issues. So it's that balance we have to talk about. So the church in Germany lost its biblical mission. That's what you're telling us. And we are in danger of you losing our biblical mission in our culture today. And you know, I just want to say this from my heart to whoever is listening. It brings tears to my eyes. I'm not talking about the liberal church. They lost their mission long ago. Evangelical churches are losing the gospel. Agreed, Eric? Unfortunately, yes. And, and by that I mean, let's make sure that we understand that the gospel isn't synonymous with uh, social justice. That's not the gospel, but it's the fruit of the gospel. It's, it's the involvement. Salvation we must always proclaim as a free gift through Christ to those who savingly believe the gospel. That's my heart. I preach that every Sunday at Moody Church, and we believe that with all of our heart. But then the question is that Eric raised, does that mean that we have done everything. What does discipleship mean in terms in the workplace and what I call the controlling realities of the culture? I think that's the issue that we're discussing here today. I mean, all this stuff is so complicated. I think about, um, you know, the idea that people say, well, I don't want to be political. I don't want to, you know, preach about whatever, same-sex marriage. I mean, let's face it. Um, most of the time, you shouldn't be preaching about that kind of stuff. I mean, there are people who want nothing more than to talk about these hot-button issues, and they have completely lost the gospel, okay? Let's, let's be honest here. Um, but I always think there's somebody in that congregation who needs to hear something uh, to give him or her hope. Now, uh, uh, struggling with same-sex issues is only one example. What about somebody, uh, what about a woman who, who's in a bad relationship, living with a boyfriend? Will she never hear that uh, that's not God's plan? Well, can she never hear that God says that, that he has someone for you who's willing to marry 
you, and if not, you shouldn't give yourself to that person. There's a, a, a woman who needs to hear that. And if you care about that woman, you feel the love of Jesus for that woman, at some point, you have to figure out a way to communicate that, whether it's in small groups or something. But to say, well, we, we don't ever want to, we never want to judge, that's a false choice. There's no such thing as you're either judging or you're, th th this, is, this is love. I think of a, the slave in the hold of a slave ship uh, in 1820. Now imagine if Wilberforce had said, oh, I don't want to be divisive and political. I don't want to talk about the slave trade. No, 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 that, that will turn some people off to the gospel. So I'll keep my mouth shut about the demonic injustice being done to my African brothers. I'll keep my mouth shut. And you know what? Whatever, who cares? I'm gonna preach the gospel. What kind of a gospel are you preaching? What kind of a selfish monster are you if you don't care about the African slave suffering? You say, I just wanna quote unquote preach love. There's a time where preaching love means speaking against the slave trade. It means speaking against killing the unborn. It means speaking against uh, norms of sexuality that are outside of the scripture. If you really say it out of love and you say it because you're trying to reach people, I mean, there are people that could say Jesus loves you in a hateful way. Uh, and there are people that can speak about these things in a loving way. And so really, um, to say that it's got to be one or the other, it is, it is crazy. It's unbiblical. I think of the Jew in the boxcar hoping that some Christians out there are not just stinking hypocrites and who actually believe what Jesus said and are willing to be a little political and a little divisive. Now, if somebody thinks that means that it's good to be a loudmouth, divisive culture warrior, I certainly don't think so, right? And we have to have sensitivity on all these issues, and especially the same-sex issue. There are people struggling with this. You've got to have compassion for them. You've got to understand how hard it must be, and if you're not struggling with that, you, you need to understand that's very easy for us to point fingers, very easy for us to condemn, and we have to be very careful, and we have to be coming from a place of brokenness and love, hoping that we might be able to, to reach somebody, but not in love with the sound of our own voices and loving to talk about this and saying, well, I said my piece on this issue and this issue, and you know, who cares what happens? We really have to care how it's coming across, but to say nothing with this idea that I'm just preaching love, it's a magnificent misreading of scripture. Where does the courage come from to take it outside the walls of the church and into the marketplace, into the public policy arena, and to stand for biblical values? Well, I'm going to ask Eric that in a moment because uh, Bonhoeffer is the standing example. But I want to just say to this congregation, Eric, I've listened to you on YouTube. I've listened to you in many different contexts. I think the last two or three minutes were your finest moment. I agree totally. Recently, that, may, that, may be a, recently, that may be an insult ultimately because it means yeah. everything I've said up till now was yeah. not that hot. No. You know, I, I was at a place uh, not too long ago at a conference where a man got up and railed against homosexuality and I had to leave. I mean, I physically got up and walked out. I couldn't take it. The judgmentalism, the lack of brokenness, the lack of love just... Uh, preaching against that. That's why it is so important that we do this with love and brokenness and help people to understand we're doing this for your benefit and not to condemn you. Absolutely critical. Now, Eric, I know that Wayne is the moderator and he asked us a question. I'm going to tweak it a little bit. You have to get back to Bonhoeffer because that's your specialty. What was it that Bonhoeffer could see in the church in Germany as a young man that the Germans simply A, could not see, and B, did not want to hear? Um, well, um, yeah, this is why, I mean, the title of my book is Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy, because to me there's a prophetic element. The prophet sees what God sees and what others don't see, and then he tries to speak about it and to wake up the church so that they will see it and become the church, or in the case of the Old Testament, become the people of God. Um, because before that, they had been the people of God, but not really the people of God. And so Bonhoeffer um, saw a number of things. The reason he saw them, I'll start there, is to some extent because of the breadth of his experience. 
because he came from a reasonably wealthy family and tremendously cultured family, he had exposure to things that many people didn't have exposure to. For example, travel. He and his family traveled widely. So he was able to spend a year in New York, and he was able to uh, take a view of things that were outside of his culture. If you only see things in your culture, you don't see the cultural blinders that you have. You're unaware of the cultural filters that you have. The gospel always has to be the pure gospel. Right, uh, and you know, to, to say that you know you've got to dress this way or this way to be a Christian, or you've got to do this or this, or this. the pure gospel is devoid of those kinds of cultural shibboleths, I guess is the word. And so you have to have a view, a broad view. Bonhoeffer had a broad view, and he brought that to the Lutheran German Church. Uh, he was able to see things they had been so accustomed, for example, to seeing the government and the church as one. And uh, you know, many people realize that that's what. Uh, destroyed the church in a way because of World War I. The church was so behind the Kaiser and the, the, the efforts of Germany in, in World War I. In fact, this happened in, in Britain and that, that, that the churches were very much behind the governments. And so the people lost uh, faith in the church after this because there had been this incredibly cozy relationship. But that's to the side. Bonhoeffer saw that this problem in Germany uh, or rather that this tendency in Germany was a problem. And he said, we have to remove our cultural blinders and see the gospel purely, see what the scripture says purely. And he was able to do, I always say this, that is because his father was one of the most, was the most famous psychiatrist in Germany for the first half of the 20th century, he was a genius scientist who taught his children to think clearly, to understand exactly what is the fact what is the evidence, and then to follow the logic rigorously. Bonhoeffer did this in the world of theology. And so Germans, and especially German Christians, German Christian pastors, we, were getting pulled. In other words, they'd follow the logic this far and then get pulled by Luther said this, or we've always done this, or we've always done this. And Bonhoeffer said, I don't care what we've always done. What does the pure gospel say? What does the scripture say? So he followed it. And anyone could have done it, but no one did because they were so used to these ruts. Now, we all have them. We have them here in America, of course, in all different kinds of strains. Everyone has them. Bonhoeffer had this cosmopolitan upbringing that enabled him uh, to see these things. For example, they had many Jewish friends. Now, your average German didn't. But he was part of this cosmopolitan world of academia. Lots of the professors uh, that lived in the Grunewald neighborhood, they were Jewish and so on and so forth. His sister married a Jewish man. So he had this, this is just, the, I'll stop here, but this is the main thing, is that he had this perspective. One, it comes from the relationship with Jesus that he had, which was so pure and clear and extraordinary. And the other thing is simply from this natural um, a gift that he had growing up in this family, in this environment that gave him a much broader, much more international picture of the Church of Jesus Christ. You know, I have to follow up on something. When Bonhoeffer was here in America, and of course he attended an African-American church in New York, and he saw them worship, and that would probably be the time of his conversion when he finally uh, saw what the Holy Spirit could do. But here's the thing, he also saw the segregation in America and what it was doing. Now, this was important to him because, you know, Hitler tried to influence the church by what was known as the Brown Synod when his brown shirts showed up for the Synod. And the thing that they wanted to implement was the Aryan Clause. The Aryan Clause said that no one of Jewish blood can occupy a pulpit in Germany. Now, there are many pastors who went along with that arguing, well, the Jews can have their own congregations. It was separate, but... Um, equal but separate. Bonhoeffer saw what that kind of philosophy did in the United States, and he said, the church, in order to be the church, cannot make these racial distinctions. As Jewish people become believers in Messiah, they are part of the body of Jesus Christ, and at stake is the issue of what the church really is. And many of those insights came from his time here in America. That's so, right. So yeah. my question is, are, are we heeding those voices today? We know what's going on. We, we see it. We hear about it. Are we heeding it? Are we paying it close enough attention? Short answer, no. Long answer? It's still no, yeah. yeah. It's still no. Uh, 
you know, I want to ask Eric, and uh, it's interesting, Eric, that sometimes you do get to short answers. I mean, that's uh, wonderful. It's fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> you can tell he's shocked. What I want to know is, what did Bonhoeffer see that the church didn't, and what are we missing? Uh, what is it that we're not seeing? Now, I have a couple of ideas, but I'd like to hear you speak to that, Eric, first of all. I mean, here's Bonhoeffer. Hitler has just been installed as chancellor. He's giving a speech in Berlin on radio, warning, and the microphone is mysteriously cut off. Now, I read your book, and we don't know exactly why. Aren't you glad that I picked up that point because we always heard it, you know, that somebody didn't want him on the air, and we can't prove no, that. No, we don't know that that's and, true. And, you know, because you're a historian, you just will not connect those dots. I mean, you just want to be so true about everything well, there, you there write. Well, there are a couple of things in my book that there, it's part of the mythology of Bonhoeffer. That's one of them. Yeah. The other one is that he got on, the, got on the last ship in 1939, the last ship going back. I don't think it was the last ship. You know, let's get it right. Let's get everything as right yeah, as we right. can. But the point is, he saw things. Eric... What are we as a church missing that's coming down the pike? Um, I guess, you know, the, the ultimate hot button issue today, of course, has to do with, with same-sex marriage, right? And I think we have to frame it properly so that people understand. We talked a little bit about that. But I think um, whenever uh, th this comes, because my, my father came from Greece in the 50s, my mother came from Germany in the 50s, uh, they experienced communism. They, they knew that this country was the land of freedom, and they came here, and so I cherish those things, and I don't take those things for granted. So when I feel a herd mentality in the culture, right away, uh, it raises red flags with me. And it, it could just be a contrarian impulse, because sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a good thing that's happening, but I just go, you know, if everybody's for it, I'm wary of it, right? And... Uh, you've, you've gotten this, you know, in the last 30 years with the environmental, the green stuff. I mean, I remember I was working at a company, I guess, 20 so, something years ago, and anything green that came up to like, oh, we want to get on that bandwagon, let's get on that. But it's corporate America is the definition of gutless. <laughs> That's true. Now, that not everybody in corporate America, but most of them, they're utterly gut. They'll do anything to get that bottom line ticked up a little bit on, in the quarter. And so when it was the green issue, if we can get some environmental thing or whatever it is, they, they don't care if it's true or not. They don't give a darn. It's just jump on it, and we want to get on that band, whatever bandwagon we can get on. Now, the gay issue has pretty much become that today, right? And so when those things happen, you're not getting clear thought. You're not getting any kind of clarity. So no matter where you come out, you're wrong because it's, it's so muddy. And that issue, for me, um, I guess, again, I want to say that we, we have to look at our hearts. Um, but when the church is not speaking up or not saying, wait a minute, because they're afraid to speak, at that moment, I say, wait a minute. In the United States of America, you're afraid to speak? Wow. That's sick. That's really sick. But the cultural pressure has ratcheted up over the last 10 or so years so that now people are afraid to speak. That makes me sick. This is the United States of America. And the idea that, well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say anything because, because, now, the last day that I was with Chuck Colson, I wanna say this. Um, there was a conference called Breaking the Spiral of Silence. Uh, and I had the honor of introducing what ended up being Chuck's last speech. He was stricken in the middle of the speech, um, taken out, and died some weeks later. Um, and I just lo love Chuck so much. Uh, but at that conference, the concept breaking the spiral of silence has to do with this idea. I guess there's some sociologist, uh, German sociologist, who's talking about Germany in the 30s. And it's this idea that people, the less people speak out, the more difficult it is to speak out. So if the church as one had spoken against the Nazis, there is no question that they would have won. No question. But they were timid, they didn't want to get on the wrong side of so-and-so, or my boss is a Nazi, or whatever, so they, they were very, very careful. And by being careful, every day that passed, it became more difficult to speak against the Nazis because the Nazis got more and more powerful, right? Now this doesn't, it's whoever. I mean, this is just the, the parallel that I'm aware of. But, but that idea that you could have said something, 
But every day that passed, it got more difficult. And so Chuck Colson talked about this idea of breaking the spiral of silence. You have to speak. And the more people who speak, the easier it is to speak, right? So if some cultural figure says something on TV, uh, suddenly people can have a conversation, we can talk about it. When the church gets sucked into this spiral of silence, and on this issue it has happened, it, it simply concerns me as an American. Because I say again, I'm thinking, for example, of there is somebody struggling with same-sex attraction. Now, there we know that there's a continuum, okay? Somebody, you know, there are many people that they're really bisexual. They're, it's just a huge continuum. But just take somebody who's struggling with that and who really doesn't feel that that's the path, let's say, that he wants to take. Does, in this culture, that person ever hear, ever a voice that says, you don't have to take that path if you don't want to? We've abandoned that person, the church especially, but the culture has abandoned that person and said, you know, we're not going to speak up for you because I'll be unpopular. I have to buy into this narrative that says, you know, you're born that way, that's it. Da, 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 da. I mean, anybody who has any experience in this world knows that that's simply not true, that some people are very much that way, but there's a huge continuum of people. And if somebody is struggling with this, we don't even give them the idea that it's possible that they don't have to act on that. And I think if you cared about that person, you know, you'd want to have a conversation about these issues. In this culture, we're not having that conversation. The church has been silenced on this issue. And um, I, I'll, I'll say this, it's a religious liberty issue because if the church can be silenced on this, it's going to go farther and farther and farther. The idea that somebody can be forced to bake a cake, you know, I don't care about that. It's the principle of it, right? You know, bake the stupid cake, who cares? Pray over the cake and send it on its way. But the, it's the principle. It's the principle of it. And the church is timid. We don't want to get involved in this. If we don't get involved in it soon, boldly and lovingly with the brokenness of Jesus, we will rue the day that we kept our mouths shut. And that day is today. Yeah. Um, Eric, I want to speak to that issue also, but I, uh, you're, you're on a roll and you have to finish it. Tell them what Bonhoeffer said about silence. Right now? Right now. Don't be he's silent. Put me on the he's that's putting a, me on the that's spot. That's an open invitation right there. Okay, all right. If you're silent, um, should, yeah. I, should I? No, 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 no. Oh, no, uh, I, I got it, I got it. Um, this, is, uh, this is kind of funny because I, I, I can't find where Bonhoeffer said this. Somebody's going to track this down. It's one of these quotes, but it, it sums up, even if you can't find the exact quote, it sums up so much of what he said so many times. The quote is this. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. That is exactly, the church in Germany said, you know what, if we just don't say anything against the Jews, we're okay. And Bonhoeffer says, no, 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 no. If you don't say anything to stand up for the Jews, you are a hypocrite and you're just as bad as the people who are saying things against them, or at least you're in that camp. To say nothing, you think you get out of it, God considers you guilty. That's heavy. Uh, could I just speak to the future? Of course. I believe that the thing that the church is missing today is certainly what Eric talked about. It's the most immediate uh, situation. But I think that the church also is blind to what is coming down the pike in terms of Islam. And I'm talking about the radical Islam. If you're here today as a Muslim, you know that we welcome you and we welcome everyone, and we're not talking about our neighbors, per se. But you know that there are radicals in this country who want to um, co-opt uh, religious freedom. In 2004, the FBI uncovered uh, the plan that the Brotherhood has for America. It does not include violence, because violence backfires, just like we saw over in Boston. It includes the infiltration of all of the institutions of America. I'm talking about finance, I'm talking about media, I'm talking about law. We will insist upon the freedoms of the Constitution in order to destroy the Constitution, which is exactly what I saw on a sign in a Muslim demonstration over in Detroit. And this is happening at every level, and we as a nation 
are submitting to the demands of Islam. There are things that Muslims can do today that we can't. Quick example, and uh, I say this, and I'm sorry to work in a commercial, but my most important book is on this very subject of the intrusion of Islam, the cross in the shadow of the crescent. But let me give you a contemporary example. We now know that bakers have to bake a cake for same-sex couples. They have to violate their Christian beliefs and their convictions in order to do that or else, you know, be shut down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Did you know that recently the Star um, Trucking Company was cited and charges were brought against it for relieving two Muslims of their duties because they failed to drive a truck with alcohol. And the commission, I have the information here, I won't take time to read it to you, but I have the exact wording. But the commission said this, the Equal Employment Commission, that uh, we don't get to pick and choose who has religious convictions, and if it's reasonable, we have to respect the rights of religious people to act in according to their convictions, etc. Where was that when the whole issue of a photographer needing to take a picture at a same-sex wedding or baking a cake, where was that guy? We are submitting to the demands of Islam. I remember on uh, television I saw an ACLU lawyer speak about the fact that tax dollars are being used to build prayer rooms for Muslims in our schools. And somebody said, well, isn't that contrary to church and state and, you know, ACLU and so forth? He said, no. He said, as long as the prayer is voluntary, he said, I don't have a problem with it. I'm saying, where were you when you guys were trying to get prayer out of the schools and even Bible studies, even the students using a classroom independently for themselves, and you were arguing it shouldn't happen on school premises? Where were you? Folks, hear me carefully. Dark days lie ahead. And right now, the left, as we call them, and Islam are in cahoots because they have two goals that they are working toward, the destruction of Christianity and the destruction of democracy. The OIC, Organization of Islamic Communities, for years has tried to get the United Nations to pass a resolution that would make all criticism of Islam a crime. Hate speech legislation. Sorry I'm on a roll, but I am the you pastor are. here. That's fine. Is that okay? Can I keep going? For 35 I'm, years. Keep going. You know? Absolutely. I, two weeks ago, Rebecca and I sat with a pastor in Canada whose name is McVitie. Did you know that he preached against homosexuality in Canada on his television program? His television program was taken off the air. Now it's reinstated. But on Wednesday, he has to submit his program. It is looked at by the censors on Thursday approving it for um, distribution and viewing on Sunday. And we're headed That's the same the direction. That's the great dominion, and we're headed that direction. We're headed that direction. Yes. I could give other examples of, of just recently what's happened in the whole broadcast arena, but I won't go there. Uh, I do want to talk about civil disobedience uh, and Can I just line. say one thing? Okay. Uh, uh, Why not? Because when, go ahead, when Eric. Pastor Lutzer <laughs> rants, it just gets me ranting, so I have to say, no, I just want to say something. Uh, that think of it, the irony. Now, this is you've all heard this before, but it has to be said. The irony that the 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 the, the left um, that they would somehow be in bed with hardcore uh, Islamists. The irony, because uh, Islamists, radical Muslims, don't have a charitable view towards somebody struggling with same-sex attraction. They think that they're scum. They should die. They're hateful. They're but now, now there's some quote unquote Christians who who feel that way. But I'm telling you, th th Jesus does not live in somebody who feels that way toward somebody who is broken. Okay, and so the idea is that we always have to be clear on what we teach and preach and the meaning of it. Right. In other words, that we say number one, we are all sexually broken. We are all sinners. If you're not aware that you're screwed up, then it's impossible for you to know you need a savior to get you unscrewed up, and so you're not a Christian. Okay? QED. So you have to know you're screwed up, you're messed up, so you can't point the finger at somebody else and say, that person's more screwed up than I am. 
because we're all screwed up. If we all go to hell together, but you get there like a minute before me, it doesn't really matter if we're talking about eternity. So if, if you know you're screwed up... I guess one minute after you die would be... If, the, you, know, yeah. if, you, know, if, you, know, if you know you're screwed up and you know what God has delivered you from, you're filled with gratitude and love for the other people who are screwed up, okay? Thank you. And that's something that, it's so basic, but that is the difference between actual faith in Jesus. I'm not just talking about churchgoers or angry quote-unquote Christians. I'm talking about actual faith in Jesus versus all the other religions. And at the top of the list, of course, is Islam. And the irony, the great irony, but let's keep that in mind. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you joined us uh, in the middle of this online, this is the role of the church in the culture. We are at Moody Church in Chicago, and uh, we have some questions that have been pouring in here, and, I, and I'm going to reserve time for questions, and I, but I also want to get to the issue of civil disobedience, which we'll do in just a moment. Let me, let me take this question for you, Dr. Lutzer. It's often said that Luther contributed to the German nationalism that fueled Nazism. Now, you've studied this a lot. Well, actually, I'm writing a book on the Protestant Reformation, so I've just read Luther's political writings, so I can comment. Oh, is this an exciting topic, but I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. <laughs> There's a peasant war going on. Luther encourages the peasants and uh, the princes to take better care of them, but there are riots, and Luther hates the riots, so he writes a book against the Pre, uh, the peasants, a horrible book against the murderous hordes of the peasants. He tells the princes to slay them, to kill them, and to uh, dismember them wherever they are found. And many princes did. About 100,000 peasants died. So he defends himself later, and this is the essence now. He says there are two spheres. There's the sphere of the church and Christianity. There we show love and tolerance and the fruit of the Spirit. The state is entirely different. It has to rule by the sword. And based on Romans chapter 14, the powers that be are ordained of God, and whoever resists them is resisting God. So what Luther did was say, over in this sphere, uh, th this is the sphere of the sword, this is the sphere of obedience to authority, etc. All right, now take that and let's skip several centuries to Nazism. Not blaming Nazism on Luther necessarily, but I'm just simply saying. All right, the powers that be are ordained of God, Hitler. To obey the powers is to obey God. To disagree with the powers is to disobey, uh, disobey God because it's in a different sphere with a different morality. Therefore, at Christmas time, we come home, we sing Christmas carols, we open gifts, we are nice to our family members. After Christmas, we go back to the concentration camp and we also participate in the killing of Jews, etc., etc., because the state lives by a different set of rules. Now, Luther, of course, didn't intend that it go that far, but that's the separation of power of the two spheres. Very quickly, Bonhoeffer and Niemöller get together and they have the Barman Convention, in which they say in the convention statement, we deplore the idea that there are two spheres. Jesus is Lord here. Yes, the state has its authority, but Jesus is Lord over here as well. And we as Christians have to keep our allegiance to Jesus and not think that we should blindly follow the state. All right, let me, let me bring up... Let me bring up uh, Romans 13. We've, we've referred to it a couple of times. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. We know that's Paul's words in Romans 13. Uh, Bonhoeffer crossed this line into civil disobedience. He became a double agent for the Abwehr. Is that how it's pronounced? Not even close. Okay. <laughs> no, it, it's very close. It's Abwehr. 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 Wehr. Ne later. Later. Yeah. You can teach me it's later. It's just a V. It's just a V sound. Okay. Thank Abwehr. you. Thank you. Uh, he even participated in a plot to assassinate Hitler. So he clearly crossed that line into civil disobedience. Where is that line for the average Christian living in the world today, in the cultures in which we live? Um, it's interesting. I, I get this question everywhere I go about Bonhoeffer, and um, it's a little complicated. But the first thing is, you know, we have a, a pastor here who knows this better than I do, but, you know, there's plenty killing in Scripture. We don't, well, let's put it this way when David kills Goliath, do we go hooray or what? 
Yes, we do. We go hooray. Um, that's the answer. Hooray. We go hooray. And so if that's the case, we think, well, that's before, it's before Hitler, I mean, it's before David uh, became a Christian and repented, right? No. Um, thou shalt not murder is different from killing, okay? Clearly there's a place, lament, it's, it's, it's lamented, but, the, but killing sometimes happens in war or so on and so forth. Murder is different from killing. So we have to understand that when David kills Goliath, that's not murder. We have to be able to make those distinctions, but people don't want to make distinctions. They want to make it sound all very simple. Uh, Bonhoeffer getting involved in the plot to kill Hitler, first of all, the idea that he did it flippantly or easily, he was, he was tortured about this. If there were any other way, it seems to me that you know, he was not uh, excited about this. But look, they were already in a war. People were already being killed. Uh, let's not pretend we can keep our hands clean. How do you, what do you say? That we're gonna give guns to the cops and guns to the military, but we're not gonna get our hands dirty. Well, that's pure hypocrisy. Why are we giving military weapons and why are we giving cops weapons? Is it so they can murder? Of course not. If they murder, they go to jail, or they should, right? But, but the point is there has to be protection, right? I mean, we killed Osama bin Laden. That there are times in war when you realize the only way uh, out of this is to take out the top guy. But we're doing that because we want to save hundreds or millions of lives. It's complicated, and Bonhoeffer, I think, would be the first person to say that kind of thing is, is complicated. So he even said, if I'm wrong, because I might be, I cast myself on the mercy of God. I don't, I don't have this attitude, look, some people need killing, let's get on with it. No, that's, that's Texas, that's not scripture. And, <laughs> and I think that, and, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, that's not where he was coming from. He was very measured and thoughtful and prayerful and agonized about it. But Bonhoeffer says, scripturally, we were talking about this backstage, the idea that God is a mean, nasty judge looking to find my sin and whack me, that's not the God of scripture. That's the devil, okay? God loves us, and he looks at our hearts. Now, if you think of the, par the, the parable of the talents, right? The man who buries his talents and says, you know, the judge is really harsh. I hate him, by the way. I hate the judge. Uh, he's, he's uh, you know, the master. He's, he's, he's looking for an opportunity to whack me. So I'm just, I'm gonna bury the talents. And when he comes back, I'm gonna be, here are your talents. Now leave me alone. I'm justified. Okay, you got nothing on me. The other guy loves the master. So he gambles the talents. He doesn't actually gamble them, but he invests them. He does something. He might lose them. But he says, I, I want to bless my master. I want to, I, I love him. Now the master, which is, you know, in the parable, it's God, right? He sees our hearts. So if you want to bless him, you do something to bless him because you love him and you screw it up, he sees your heart. He doesn't say, aha, I got you. No, he sees your heart. He loves you. He gives you grace and forgiveness. The other guy, he, he condemns because he says, you don't know me at all. You didn't try to bless me. All you try to do is cover your rear, basically. And how, do you know me? Do you know what I did for you? Do you know that I love you? That you, 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 don't, you don't know me at all. Those are the two views. And Bonhoeffer says many Germans were saying, I just want to cover my rear. I don't want to stick my neck out. I don't want to do anything that might be considered wrong. So I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to kill. I'm not going to get involved in any of that dirty stuff. So if a Gestapo agent comes to the door and says, are you hiding a Jew in the basement? You go, oh, of course, I'm a Christian. I'm telling you the truth. The Jew's in my basement. Go ahead and kill him, and I'll be justified before God. Isn't that what God would want me to do? No. So Bonhoeffer understood these things are more complicated, more nuanced, and it's not easy. But he says, better that I should act and get involved in the plot to kill Hitler because I think it's the right thing than do nothing because I'm afraid of making a mistake. I have to care more about loving God than about avoiding sin. That's very radical views. And to just put a button on it as far as civil disobedience goes, um, I think that, you know, it's utterly scriptural. I mean, again, we talk about, uh, you know, David, D Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, uh, you know, bowing to a, a, a statue of, uh, of Caesar. I mean, there are plenty of examples that go against Romans 13, that you have to take Romans 13 in context. Basically, it's true that, you know, if the cop says you were speeding, gives you a ticket, you know, you don't say, hey, man, I'm not under the law and, and speed off. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Um, 
we need to respect the authorities. Yes, we do, but there are limits. Martin Luther King Jr. understood those limits. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, he writes about those limits. So I have no problem with, with civil disobedience. I do have a problem with both kinds of people, people who say it's always wrong, Romans 13, or other people who say, I just love being civil. You know, I, I want to kill the president. I want to kill somebody because, you know, I'm doing it for God. I mean, if you don't understand how complex this is, and you think Bonhoeffer did this easily, and because you disagree with some abortionist, you want to kill him, or you want... Th th anybody misreading Bonhoeffer and taking it in that direction, I want to say here and now, and I say it all the time, you are wrong. You are wrong. You don't understand Bonhoeffer. He did not want to, to, to be involved in this, and it was a long uh, process, and he admitted, I might be wrong. Dr. Lutzer, civil disobedience. I want to speak about Romans 13 very directly. It's a very difficult passage. This past week I was on a plane and I read a book that had five different views of interpretation. None was entirely satisfactory because it seems to be ironclad, you know, the powers that be are ordained of God, you resist the power, you're resisting God, etc., etc. And then Paul goes on to say, he says, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. I mean, are you kidding? I mean, Paul was writing this when Rome was not exactly a Christian, uh, a Christian compliant. I think what Paul is doing there is he's writing a little bit tongue-in-cheek, and he's using the is passages as ought. In other words, the government ought to be uh, a minister to you for good. The government ought to do this. Because as Eric has pointed out, from Genesis to Revelation, you have examples of civil disobedience. I mean, the midwives who refused to kill the boys that were born over in Egypt, and God blessed them as a result of them. Let me say it even more clearly. If you say that you will obey the government, right or wrong, the government has become your God. And in answer to your question as to where the dividing line is, I think it is to some extent a matter of conscience. But I would say this, that if you're a parent and you live in California or Chicago, but especially California, and there's an edict that comes down that says that every child in the school, beginning at first grade or second grade or whenever, needs to be taught sex education and tolerance and homosexual and the normality of homosexuality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the child is going to be taught you have to experiment to see whether or not you know, you're a boy or a girl or something in between, you have an obligation to say no, absolutely not. So it seems to me there are other times like this when an individual Christian needs to say no. With regarding uh, baking a cake, and that is different, by the way, than serving somebody on, on a, a lunch counter. Because the baking of a cake involves a participatory, creative act. Some Christians may feel they can do it. Others feel that they can't. You can Our bake it, but is, you can't frost it. That's, if you really study the Old Testament, you'll see that's clear. Yeah, it's clear. Yeah. I think maybe you're reading from the reversed vision. <laughs> but the point that I'm making is the Christian should have the conscience and the right to make that decision without being told legislatively what we can and cannot do. Thank you. All right, listen. This is going so well, and I've learned so much, and I'm sure our audience has as well. I'm going to go move to questions a little bit early, Yvonne, if that's okay, because my sense is we've probably got a lot of questions stacked up here. For, so, Dr. Lutzer, this one is from the audience for you. Why did so many German Christians misunderstand Hitler when he had written Mein Kampf and telling what he saw coming? It was a foreshadowing. Uh, because the Germans didn't want to believe what they read. You know, it's just like today, there are, there are certain things that this nation does not want to hear. And nobody is as deaf as people who don't want to hear. The fact is that it was kind of like this, okay, democracy hasn't worked, the Weimar Republic is in shambles, 
we've got soup lines. Why don't we give it to a man who's promising that he's going to tear up the Treaty of Versailles, that he's going to rebuild Germany, that he's going to stare France in the face and say, absolutely, we're not going to submit to you as, as the treaty indicated, and we are going to do this. And they said, okay, the guy's crazy, but give him a chance. So that's my answer. Eric? I, well, it's interesting because it, it's... It is this clamoring for action, right? And we hear that all the time here. I mean, our president says it. P people, all kinds of people say like, yeah, all this division in government. Why don't these stupid Congress, why don't they just get together and, you know, get some stuff done? What do you want them to get done? Like, I mean, it shows pure ignorance to me when people say they need to get stuff done. What is it that they should get done? Need to make, do we need more laws? No, we need less laws probably, but the idea that we just want stuff to get done. Do you understand that a big part of political gridlock is the genius of the founding fathers? Okay? Yeah, that's right. So they said it's going to make it hard to get stuff done, and that's on purpose. So this idea that we're clamoring, well, we've got to get stuff done. I really don't know what it is they're supposed to get done, but it's just kind of, again, it's the zeitgeist, you know, all the politicians are stupid and they, they don't want to get stuff done, they, all they do is argue. You know, that's really their finest thing that they do, is argue. Uh, I think that there's, there's a place for, for disagreement and this idea, but this clamoring for action, you saw it in Hitler's time. And for example, in the Weimar Republic, uh, Pastor Lutzer was talking about that, they had a democracy imposed upon them by the Allies, right? They lost World War I. The monarchy, the Kaiser, uh, abdicates, and they have democracy imposed upon them by the Allies. And we're trained as Americans to think democracy is wonderful, right? Well, it's not necessarily wonderful any more than the free market is always wonderful. I'm in favor of both, but it doesn't mean that they always go right. You know, you can democratically elect the devil or Hitler, okay, and that's democracy in action, and it gives you bad fruit. Uh, similarly, the free market can give you, you know, free, uh, I'm sorry, the free market can, can give you better, cheaper pornography and drugs, if that's what the people want, right? So we have to look carefully about what is actually happening. And, and the idea that... Uh, that the Weimar Republic, suddenly there's democracy, it's not working for the Germans, and they say, you know what, we don't, this democracy's not working. They had real gridlock. I mean, real grid. They had all, they didn't have two parties, they had like, you know, ten parties. And so, the Germans said, we want to go back to the old days. I mean, you can hear the echoes of we want a king like Saul, right? We, we want, we want a leader, right? That's where the whole, the German word Fuhrer is leader, okay? So this whole idea of the Fuhrer principle was very popular in the early decades of the 20th century, this idea that leadership is important. We want a leader. And so the Germans are in this, in this mess of the Weimar Republic, this democracy that's doing nothing, their economy's tanking. They say, we want a leader. And so the question would be, okay, what kind of a leader do you want? And the answer would be, a leader who leads. Well, and they, I think they got one of those. And, then, and it you didn't know, go so well. And they were seduced because when he was first inaugurated, he did lead and he made many fine changes. Somebody said if he had died before World War I and the killing of the Jews, excuse me, before World War II and the killing of the Jews, he might have gone down in history as Adolf the Great. Yeah. So they were so seduced. And, you know, I just uh, reread some things this past week, and I just marveled at how Hitler co-opted the church. You know, he told them, look, I need you. You know, go ahead and preach your doctrines. Go ahead and do this, but stick with the pure gospel. Don't get involved in the political it's like that. Frightening. And they... Because that's what we're hearing, right? That's what we're hearing. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, we will take questions via Twitter as well. Use the hashtag church and culture, three words. This audience question, though, today's government is actively anti-religious. What should the average Christian do in response? Dr. Lutzer. Well, I was hoping you'd ask Eric first, but uh, I'm willing okay, to... Okay, Eric. I'm going to take the above average Christians. Go ahead. Yeah, right. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> <laughs> that would be all of us, of course. Yes. Yeah. You know, I would say this, that it depends who you are in your situation. Number one, the Bible commands us to pray for those who have the leadership over us. And it doesn't say, do that if you happen to agree with his policies. The more you disagree, the more you pray, right? And so, number one, we have a responsibility to pray for those who are in authority. Number two, 
I think what we should do is to be actively engaged. You remember earlier I used the expression redemptive involvement? We should all be involved politically. Not to that a church comes and says you should vote this way or that way, but rather individuals. Oh, this is an interesting topic. You know, I think what we did wrong back in the 80s, if I might mention the moral majority, is it was all top down. You know, in other words, we're all going to do this and we're all following this leader. I think we should have thought through stra strategy more carefully and realized that we can accomplish more from the bottom up and that we can train our people, we can get our people involved. I mean, I'm shocked at the number of evangelicals who don't even vote. If you don't vote, don't complain about our leaders, all right? But pastors... Pastors are reticent to get involved themselves and to lead their churches in political activism. Well, yes, of course. I don't lead my congregation in political activism. If by that you mean I stand up and say, vote for so-and-so. But I encourage involvement. And not only that, I hate to say this about myself, but I have preached always on, uh, you know, Scripture and the controlling realities of our culture. I mean, when the Supreme Court made their decision there that, in effect, legalized same-sex uh, marriages, I preached on God, the Supreme Court, and the unthinkable. And I out outlined uh, exactly what was happening, its implications. So I think that as a pastor, I have the responsibility of speaking about these realities and encouraging people to get involved in whatever level, because for everybody, involvement looks different. I want to just say that, um, to me, the, Bonhoeffer actually says this, and I quote it in the Bonhoeffer book, that he saw Americans, um, I guess the way I would put it to sum it up, is that you know we, we want everybody to like us, and we want to be nice guys, and we don't want to, it, it's not about truth, right? So, I mean, look, there are plenty of annoying people who are all about truth, but I'm saying that he, the typical American attitude is, I don't want to speak up, or I don't want to ruffle feathers, I want everybody to like me. Okay, so the problem with that uh, is that it can go much too far. And so you have people, for example, uh, let's say a teacher or a principal, that somebody writes a letter that I didn't like something, it was too religious or whatever. The moment you, you, you send a little letter or an email, people freak out. And they go, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And we'll back right up, we'll back right up. Well, you know, most people in America aren't beginning to get to that border where they're exercising their faith too much. In this country, the opposite is the example, that we're a mile away from that border. We don't want to even get near it because, oh, I don't want to cross that line, so I'll stay a mile away from it. So most teachers and, 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 and the principals, they don't know their, their rights. They don't know right from wrong. They, they have no idea. Now, some organizations are, are helping them to, to think this stuff through. I guess the ACLJ has some stuff. But as Americans, we need to know what is the constitutionally protected uh, way to express your faith. And most people, we, we, we don't even want to get near controversy, so we're a million miles away from that. And therefore, we are denuding the public square of any faith. It's becoming the naked public square, in the words of Richard John Newhouse, so that we've secularized the public square. That's precisely against the vision of the founders who wanted a robust expression of faith and religion in the public square, in the public square, not just in the churches. And, and, and um, you had something you wanted to say. I want to... I wanna... No, finish, finish. I'm, I'm all ears. I, I don't believe that for a second. Uh, the, it, it's just, I guess I want to say this as far as pastors go. It's the same thing with pastors. If every pastor in America would creep up to the edge where he's pushing against having his 501c3 status revoked, that's exactly where the church should be, on that line. And, and if, you're not, if, you're not pushing, if you're not pushing up against that, you're, you're not fulfilling your role. You should, I mean, if every pastor were pushing against that, the whole culture would change. And that's exactly what I saw in Germany. The pastors were timid. Oh, we don't want to, we don't want to do it. It's your job. And if every pastor would push against that, let, let, let the IRS deal with 
30,000 pastors pushing against that line. I don't think they can deal with that. You know what has happened in our culture is this. If you indicate in the public square any kind of religion, especially if you refer to God and Jesus, you're a uh, right-winged radical who has to be avoided. We've had so much bad publicity over who we are that even the most innocent intrusion, as Eric was talking about, is immediately spoken against. And we are immediately branded. And that's the thing that we have to put up with. And there has to be that balance because we don't want to be stumbling blocks to the gospel. But on the other hand, love now is defined as everything that you agree with. We have to let the Bible define what love is and not popular culture. Dr. Lutzer, you brought up the matter of Islam, and we know that Islam pushes the idea of Sharia law. And a question from the audience here about that. How does constitutional religious freedom uh, stand in contrast with Sharia law? How, do the, how can the two possibly coexist? Well, uh, they can't coexist. If you have Sharia law, Sharia law is contrary to our Constitution because it does not give civil rights to women. It has certain penalties that are attached to it. It assumes a Muslim worldview, et cetera, et cetera, in all kinds of details. And sometimes we find our good Muslim friends who will tell us, you know, I, uh, I actually uh, am a Muslim, but I don't believe in Sharia law. That's something like a Jewish man saying, I'm Jewish, but I don't believe in the Ten Commandments. Sharia law is deeply embedded in Islam. It isn't too strong to say that Sharia law is Islam. And so when you look at these laws and you realize the extent to which it is to control your life, it's not just an issue of women's rights, it's a matter of penalties for various uh, wrongdoings and so forth. It is contrary to our Constitution which emphasizes equal rights and it is basically opposed also to freedom of religion. Yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's the death, I mean it's ironic, right? Because it's the death of freedom of religion. The moment Sharia law is implemented, that's the end of freedom of religion for every single person who doesn't buy, buy, abide by Sharia law, so it's, uh, it's ironic. But um, I just wanted to say that we have to understand that there's no such thing as religious, all religious freedom or no religious freedom. All of these things are, have to be um, weighed against each other and push against each other. I mean, one person's, I mean, if I say my religion says, you know, I, I, I want to smoke weed all the time and I want to smoke weed on the bus, you know, uh, <laughs> And somebody else says, well, my religion is, you know, whatever, to, to carry poisonous snakes, and I want to carry them on the subway. You know, you understand there is a role for the government to say, no, you can't do that. Now, when that bumps up against your religion, you don't like it, of course. And so we have to understand that this is not an all or nothing. This is a complicated situation. And so if somebody says, it's my right to refuse somebody, I don't like that person's race, and when they come in my restaurant, I'm not gonna feed them a hamburger. Our government said, sorry, but uh, you can't do that. There are, there are limits to freedom, there are limits to religious freedom, and we are in the business in the United States of America of figuring that out. We're not gonna figure it out all at once. We haven't figured it out all at once. It took until the 60s to figure out that you know, you have to serve burgers to people that maybe you don't like them for some strange reason, right? It's taking us time to figure these things out. That's okay. It's okay. And I think that some Christians can get all huffy about, I want my, my rights and I refuse to, you know, how far do you carry it? Let's say I don't want to bake a cake to celebrate a gay marriage. Okay, what if somebody uh, comes and they want a wedding cake uh, for a heterosexual marriage, but, you know, one of the guys is a Muslim uh, or a pagan, or a, you understand how complicated it becomes, how quickly it becomes complicated. So we have to tread lightly, and we have to understand it is complicated. There are things that people say, well, that's my religious freedom, where the government has said, sorry, you can't do that. Polygamy. Uh, some people would say that's part of my religion. Well, we have said in most cases you can. Now, that's actually beginning to shift now again, but I think we need to be humble and understand this, this is complicated, right? and not everybody's gonna be happy, and we have to be sober-minded and careful as we go into this. Eric, a question has come uh, to you. As you studied and wrote about the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, what surprised you the most? 
uh, I'll, I'll say that uh, fairly quickly. Basically, uh, it's what I alluded to in the beginning or mentioned. Uh, I had this idea that he was theologically liberal or that he became very theologically liberal, even kind of an agnostic humanist toward the end of his life. And as I studied him, I realized that's crazy. And I couldn't believe that, that uh, it was just not true. I mean, Bonhoeffer is very complicated, he's brilliant, but it became clearer and clearer to me that this concept about Bonhoeffer was basically false. And it was shocking to me because I thought, who am I? I'm not a scholar, I'm just sort of telling this popular version. But when you start reading his letters and his journals, it, it becomes incredibly clear that he was a passionate Christian all the way to the end, and that most of those scholars got it very wrong. So that surprised me. If I may, it's, it's so hard to say what's a favorite part of the book for me, but I love the chapter about him coming to New York and going to that black church and then taking those spirituals, those, that music, home to Germany and playing it for his, the, those that he mentored. I, I just found that very inspiring. Good. Um, <laughs> I, uh, it is inspiring. You're, you're a challenge, you know because, that? <laughs> because... Well, the thing is, Pastor Lutzer said he, he thinks that's when Bonhoeffer uh, got saved or came to faith. I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I think it's, it's complicated. I think if you read what Bonhoeffer wrote before his time in New York in the black church, he, he got the gospel just amazingly clearly. I mean, it was amazing. But something happened to his heart and his life. Uh, when he went to the black church because he suddenly saw a suffering population. I mean, he saw this African-American church is full of people that they're not playing games. This is real. Life is hard, and they're worshiping a real God. He wasn't seeing that in the mainline Protestant churches, definitely not in the mainline Protestant churches in New York. But it, it, it moved him because he saw, I could be all in. It's not just about theology. It's about my whole life. It's about living out all this stuff. He saw that in the African-American church, and I mean, my goodness, it did change his life. Dr. Lutzer, we have mentioned the name Martin Niemöller here tonight, and of course his famous statement, I'm going to read it now, we've all heard it, but he said, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I am not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. That speaks powerfully to all of us today. That's a contemporary thing that we can take uh, take stock of now exactly. for us. Exactly. I mean, that famous station, uh, statement should be emblazoned on every uh, pastor's door. It's not on mine, so I can't uh, emphasize that too much. But the fact is that what we are reminded of is that all of this happens in incrementally. You know, it's not as if suddenly we wake up and everything has changed, although we've had some instances in America when it seemed that way. But slowly, you see, as the noose begins tighter and tighter against the church and against the laws, we may wake up someday and say, well, I didn't speak for so-and-so, and I didn't speak for so-and-so, and now it is too late. So that's where we could be. Yeah, I, I want to I wanna speak to that because I think a lot of times there are elements in the church that are, they're, again, they're so theologically oriented that the love of Jesus is not in people. It's all about theology. And so I know people that, you know, they, they look at Mormons like, you know, they, they're, they're, if, if there are laws enacted against Mormons or if Mormons are knocked, let's say, you know, in a Broadway musical, which is doing very well right now, called the, that they take kind of a, they, they don't mind. They kind of like that if Mormons are, Mormons are getting knocked and they would never vote for a, you know, a candidate who's Mormon. They, they have this very, um, parochial, narrow view, and uh, the same thing about Catholics. In other words, people said with the HHS mandate, you know, if, if uh, it's got to do with contraception, yeah, that's that crazy Catholic thing. I couldn't care less about that. And let the Catholics take it on the chin. They deserve it anyway. They're a cult, you know. And uh, I have to tell you, when somebody has that kind of an attitude, th the truth is not in them because they're not perceiving that these principles will affect you you will be on the other end of that ridicule or you will be on the other end of the government forcing you to do something. Uh, and then the love of Jesus is not in you. Because if you see those people as your enemies, you, you don't understand. They have a different theology. They're not your enemies. Jesus died for them and you need to show the love of Jesus to them. And I'll say this also about gays. Um, 
when you know about the story of, for example, the Stonewall riots, okay, let's, let's think about that for a second. Imagine you're a person, you're confused sexually, okay, uh, and you're trying to live your life. You don't know what to do or whatever, so you go to a bar, okay, a gay bar, and the cops, okay, you can just see these big, tough cops, treat you like dirt because you're just a fairy and they can beat you up and who's gonna, what are you going to say? I'm a cop. What are you going to do? Now, that kind of bullying is of the devil. It's not of Jesus, okay? They were treated horribly. Now, to the extent that any so-called Christian would, re would rejoice in that, you're, you're clearly missing the picture. It, and I think that that's what happens is we become so, so polarized that instead of thinking of somebody as a uh, a person made in the image of God who's just doing their best to get by, you think of them somehow as the enemy and you create a group. And that is against scripture and it's against Jesus, right? That we've got to show love. And I really do see that, um, you know, there's a time to stand up for groups with whom you disagree, right? And I think that when you're talking about, uh, in this case, the Mormons or the Catholics on the HHS mandate, or when we're actually talking about treating gays like dirt, okay? I mean, in our history, let's face it, the world gets it wrong coming or going, okay? So if we all pretend like we are, you know, sexually pure and wonderful and they're freaks, scum, well, that's not scriptural. It's also not scriptural to say, oh, what they're doing is a wonderful thing and we all have to celebrate it or else. That's not scriptural either. But you can go wrong both ways. And I think that you really, this is why I admire Bonhoeffer. He had the purity to see through these things. He didn't just go with the crowd. What's the crowd saying today? Oh, the, the, today the crowd's saying that, uh, you know, homosexuals are perverts and freaks and we can persecute them a little bit. That's good. Not good. Um, you know, the love of Jesus and that kind of persecution. But, I, you know, you see that with certain Christians toward Mormons. You see that with certain Christians toward Catholics. It, it's, it's simply, it's misunderstanding things on a number um, of levels. And, you know, those people will have themselves to blame when they come for us, which they will. Time for a couple of more questions. Uh, this is for you, Eric, although you may want to uh, speak to this too, Dr. Lutzer. What happened with the evangelical church in Germany after World War II. Eric, do you well, that's, know? That's easy. I don't know. Okay. My book goes up to 1945. I have a that's feeling it. Dr. Lutzer... <laughs> In all seriousness, I, I don't want to say much on that because I really don't know enough. I know Dr. Lutzer knows more than I do on that. Uh, thank you for that overwhelming vote of confidence. <laughs> Not much, but a little I more. I want to say more. this, that just remember, when you're in Europe and, and, uh, and you're in Germany and you see the phrase on a church, evangelische Kirche, evangelical church, does not mean evangelical like we are evangelicals. It means Lutheran. So it may be thoroughly and totally liberal. So the question is, what about the evangelical church? It's very small, but here I want to talk to you about one of the pastors who preached a sermon, and his name isn't coming to me, but if I talk about him, it'll come to mind, in Stuttgart, Germany, where he stood up, and he was an evangelical pastor, and he preached a sermon that would take your breath away regarding the judgment of God on Germany because they cast down the cross of Jesus Christ. He said, we believed in weapons. He said, we believed in our leader. We were seduced. We were... Um, we were judged by God because he says, God will not be mocked, and we have cast down the cross of Christ. And what he was acknowledging was the loss of the gospel in Germany was the cause of Germany's ultimate demise. Could I give you one more quote? It's very interesting coming from a Jewish man, Henrich Heine, who was not a Christian. He was Jewish, but he looked at the cross like a magical charm. But he said something very interesting in the days long before Hitler. He said, um, regarding the cross, he said, only the cross of Christ is keeping Germany back from war. And should that cross be broken from Germany, a terror will be unleashed that will cause the whole world to wonder. Well, isn't that interesting? The swastika is in German, a Hackenkreuz, a broken cross. And it was broken in Germany, and it was followed instead of the cross of Christ, 
and from Germany this made. So that since I'm speaking, let me continue. The cross of Jesus Christ is keeping America back from total demise. And should that cross be hidden in our churches? Should it be replaced with a health and wealth theology? Should it be replaced by all kinds of nice positive messages about how wonderful people are? Should it be replaced by nutritional sermons on our television set? From America, a stench will be unleashed that will cause the whole world to wonder. Let me... Um... Let me just piggyback on that incredible bummer of a message. Uh, no, in all seriousness, this is, I mean, that's entirely true. And I think that most folks here are getting this. But I believe that just as the church did not heed the prophetic voice of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? It did not. It had a chance, and it did not. Uh, and for all these 70, 80 years have been muted and, and shamed. Germany has br been brought low. They can hardly speak of the war. They just, they carry that shame around. I actually believe that the, the, that the reason the Bonhoeffer story has come to light now is because God is giving the American church a second chance to say, you will go this way, but you don't have to. If you will hear my voice, and you will obey me and be brave, break the spiral of silence, speak in love, if you will do that, if the church will be the church, this doesn't have to happen. And to me, that's a chilling thing to think that it is up to us. It is up to the church today whether this incredibly great nation goes in that direction or that direction. We're meant to be the hope of the world. There are people around the world looking at America and, and they want the freedoms we have, they want the, the, the uh, financial opportunities, they want these things. If we go down, many, many people will suffer. So this is not a small thing, and I really believe it is up to the church. There are many more questions, but I'm going to draw the line there. But I'm going to ask each of you to take about five minutes, and by the way, even if we have read Hitler's Cross and Bonhoeffer, to go back and reread these books now in light of this conversation, I think would be a very valuable experience and a teaching experience for all I don't, of us. I don't feel that people have to read it, but at least buy another copy. That's, yeah, my, yeah, okay. that's my thing. You know, buy it, put it on a shelf, it won't go bad. Buy, buy it in Dutch or other languages and just admire it, right? Okay. Take, each of you take about five minutes and just summarize where we've been tonight. Eric, we'll start with you, and we've, we've covered a lot of territory. We've left a lot uncovered, obviously, but just for about five minutes. Well, Bonhoeffer, um, we, we referred to the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm's Gedächtniskirche, and I'd like to refer to it again. Um, that church, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I said it earlier, but in, uh, I think it was 1931, uh, Bonhoeffer had just come back from New York, and he was being, being given opportunities, this brilliant young man, about 26 years old, to preach in these big churches. And it's probably about the size of, of this church, but it was the jewel of Berlin. You know, it was the church. And um, uh, Hindenburg probably would, would attend. When he went to church, that's where he would go. You know, it was the place to see everybody. And that's where those murals are, right? With the Kaiser in his ermine robes and his queen and Jesus. This mixing of church and state that made me uncomfortable. So in 1931, Bonhoeffer preached a sermon there when on Reformation Day, Reformation Day is, you know, the day that Luther, you know, nailed the 95 Theses. I mean, it's, it's the day that we celebrate the Reformation. Now imagine being in the church in Germany, right? You know, it's like the National Cathedral, practically. You're, you're in the church. It's almost like a national church. Not quite, but the same kind of thing. And you're celebrating Reformation Day, and you're really celebrating Martin Luther, and you're really celebrating yourselves. They weren't worshiping Jesus. They're worshiping, aren't we wonderful? Aren't we wonderful? We're all German. We're Lutherans. And we gave the world Protestantism, which is to say Christianity, which is to say we're looking good. And we want to celebrate that on Reformation Day. It's very similar to uh, in a church in America, and you know that this must happen on July 4th, 
a kind of a service which is taking its focus off of Jesus and onto, aren't we wonderful with our white picket fences and our great values, unlike, you know, godless uh, communists or whatever. You, you sort of celebrate yourself. And I think that that can go in any direction, right? The devil doesn't really care what direction you go in as long as you go away from worshiping Jesus, because to worship Jesus is to humble yourself, to know that you are a sinner, you are no better than the worst of sinners. To know that and to worship him is different from anything else, which is an idol. And so I, I think typically we think of ourselves as, oh, we're going to go in the direction where, you know, we're going to worship America and we're going to have, you know, a, a third Bush presidency and we're going to have this big, you know, pe there are a lot of people sort of on the liberal side that are worried about that. I have to tell you, I don't think we're going to go in that direction. If we were to go in any direction, it would, thank you. If we were going to go in any direction, I think it's sort of what I was talking about earlier. The zeitgeist is to worship how wonderfully tolerant we are. Uh, aren't we wonderful? And the people who aren't tolerant, aren't they bad? And I, I, I really fear um, that kind of thinking, that kind of self-worship that aren't we tolerant and wonderful? And isn't it wonderful that we're reading the Quran in our church? Irony of ironies. Uh, I mean, I have to say that that to me, I really fear that because that's the powerful move of the zeitgeist. Zeitgeist means the spirit of the age, right? That's the move and that's never God, where God is moving. And so I think we have, to, we have to worry about that. If the church will be the church, we will stand against that. Let me say this finally. Bonhoeffer in that sermon that day preached a thundering Philippic, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-P-I-C. -I -I if you've got your phones, you can look it up. It was a harsh rant on the day that they were expecting this wonderful, you know, aren't we wonderful Lutheran, Germans, whatever. He delivered a prophetic Philippic against the German church, which was worshiping the corpse of Martin Luther instead of the living Jesus. They didn't want to hear that, did they? Well, that was Reformation Day, 1931, in that church. And 14 years later, that church was bombed to rubble. It's like when Jesus said, you know, not one stone here will stand. I mean, it was like a prophetic act. I don't think Bonhoeffer knew it the way Jesus did. But when you look at that church and think he preached that sermon in that church, we need to point people to the cross and to the gospel. It doesn't really matter where they're off. We need to point them to that. And that's what Bonhoeffer was doing in that church with the murals of the Kaiser and all this wonderful stuff. And today, it's a, it's a ruin. And let it be a lesson to all of us. Sobering. Dr. Lutzer, one of the takeaways for me is redemptive involvement. Redemptive involvement, absolutely. Let me give you a couple of lessons that I've jotted down here for us. First of all, my dear brothers and sisters, will you remember when we seem to be crowded out and marginalized as a church that the Church of Jesus Christ has been in a similar predicament and even a worse predicament than we are in? And God is faithful to his people in the midst of marginalization, in the midst of suffering, and uh, guess what? The church isn't in the hands of the ACLU. It isn't in the hands of the media. Will you be encouraged by reminding yourself that we are still in the hands of Jesus? Will you remember that? Uh, thank you, but I'm not finished yet. Secondly, as you see the pressure and you see the church being marginalized, will you remember, it's not our politicians that brought this about. It's our culture. And what is happening in America today is the true church is being revealed. I believe that the day of nominal Christianity is going to come to a close in America because we're going to have to declare ourselves. I'd like to take out time to read what Niemöller said when he mounted the pulpit of his church in Berlin. We have all of us, the whole church and the whole community, have been thrown into the tempter sieve, and he is shaking, and the wind is blowing, and it must now become manifest whether we are wheat or chaff. Verily a time of sifting has come upon us, and even the most indolent and peaceful person among us must see that the calm of a meditative Christianity is at an end. It is now springtime for hope and so forth. Satan swings his sieve and Christianity is thrown hither and thither. 
He who is not ready to suffer, he who called himself a Christian only because he thereby hoped to gain something good for his race and nation, is blown away like chaff and the wind. This is a time of sifting. The true church is being revealed in the midst of our pressure cooker. Third, the need for courageous Christians. Very quick story. Niemöller is tried for uh, abuse of pulpit. Did you know that he was tried under the muzzling, uh, muzzle decree for abuse of pulpit, hate speech? He was preaching against the Reich. So he's taken and he's imprisoned. He has to go to court and he is in prison and a young Nazi guard comes along to take him under the tunnel to the courthouse. They're walking along and suddenly Niemöller hears this sound bounce around. He's hearing words. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Whoever runs into it is safe. And it's coming from the Nazi guard. I wonder about that boy. I wonder if he was brought up in a Christian home. But the cultural pressure of Nazism made him a Nazi soldier or Nazi guard. Courage. We're not studying all of the pastors and priests who submitted to the Hitler's agenda. We go back and we're inspired by Bonhoeffer because he was a man of courage and went against the tide. Fourth, we need to restore the gospel to evangelical churches. We need to restore the gospel. And by that I mean to have preaching that is uh, biblical in the sense that it deals with a lot of different issues and not just all the pa uh, positive stuff because we want to bring the world into the church and the, uh, the people. And, and we want to hear at Moody Church too. We want all the crowds who walk by here to come to church. So don't misunderstand. But at the same time, we cannot ignore hard doctrines such as the doctrine of judgment and hell if it is preached with a very love that Metaxas has been talking about repeatedly tonight. And it has to be preached with that. But we have to call the church back to the gospel and to the cross. Bonhoeffer said it is not before us but before the cross that the world trembles. We need to get that back. I quoted Heinrich Heine before about the cross of Jesus Christ. Number five, be encouraged. It's possible to be faithful without freedom of religion. We think to ourselves, oh, our freedom is gone. But as Metaxas has pointed out, we are an anomaly. This is not the way the church had it. Europe didn't have freedom of religion until the Council of um, Westphalia in uh, 1648. You think of Luther standing at the Diet of Worms standing at a, against a thousand years of church history and tradition. My conscience is taken captive by the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant, so help me God. And he expects to be put to death. And there is the edict of Worms said, kill him, but give him time to go back because he had been promised uh, safe conduct. And Charles V later regretted that he gave him that safe conduct and wanted him dead right now. Where are those courageous Christians? I saw a question on this uh, monitor here, more questions than we can possibly answer. But one is, what about the young people? Yeah, what about the young people? Are we raising our children with the kind of courage that is needed so that they will stand against the tide? Where is the Bonhoeffer and the Niemöllers in today's world? May it be found among us. So be encouraged. These people were faithful without freedom of religion. Final lesson to encourage you as you go. It's not necessary to win in this life in order to win in the life to come. Isn't that wonderful? I think you ought to clap. <laughs> history, church history is strewn with the lives of people who gave their life when I lead tours to the Reformation, we go to the Lamont River and I explain how Felix Mons was drowned and how Anabaptists were massacred by the hundreds and the thousands, these rebaptizers who were the best Christians on God's planet. They lost in this life, but they won in the world to come. Now I'm sitting beside an expert of Bonhoeffer, but anyway, I'm going to end with a Bonhoeffer story, whom he, and he knows it better than I. It's time for him to be hung in Flossenburg, okay? 
He's asked to strip uh, naked. He goes, and this brings tears to my eyes, close to the gallows and kneels and prays. And if I remember correctly, his last words are, O oh Lord, for me, this is the end, but it is the beginning of life. A doctor who was sent there to make sure that he died, to check to see that he was indeed dead, said that he had never seen anyone die with such tranquility as Bonhoeffer and Bonhoeffer's faith in God. He didn't win in this life. What was he, 33 years old? He dies at the age of 33, but he wins in the life to come. In a moment, we are going to dismiss you, but go in the strength and the power of a sovereign God and be faithful to him no matter the cost, and you will win. Whether we win our culture war, whether we win America back, let us ask ourselves the question, what does faithfulness look like to me in the midst of America today and sharing the good news of the gospel and living it out? Those are my closing words. We are so thankful for you men. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching the discussion that we've just had with Eric Metaxas. I hope that what we presented was of help to you. But now the large crowd that was here for that discussion has left. And I want to speak to you personally, face to face, about something that is very important and very heavy on my heart. You notice when Eric Metaxas gave his final words how he stressed the fact that Bonhoeffer preached in the Kaiser Wilhelm Church in Berlin and nobody wanted to hear what he had to say? I think that the greatest parallel between the church in Germany and the church in America is its pride. We also don't want to hear the message that I believe God wants us to hear. Take, for example, in the book of Revelation, of the seven churches, I believe it is four that Jesus Christ calls to repentance. My friend, we can't win the war, the culture war that we've heard so much about. As a matter of fact, I think we've lost it. When you go home tonight and turn on the television, you might discover some other domino that has just fallen, another battle that we have just lost. The world is not listening to us, perhaps because the church is not listening to God. You know, only God can really reverse the, the direction that we are going here in America. Only God can do that. We can't. What we have to do as believers is cast ourselves upon him. I believe that we should get on our faces before God. We should repent of our moral impurity, repent of the materialism. We're just like the church at Laodicea. To repent of our pride, even our nationalism. For we also equate Christianity with Americanism, just as the Germans equated Christianity with Germanism, if I can use a word like that. Would you take out time to call on the Lord? And let me make another suggestion. Why don't you go to the internet and click on onecry.com. Onecry.com, all one word, is an organization called Life Action. They are calling together thousands of believers who are coming together to pray for this great nation. In fact, when you go there, you will soon see that there is a document there entitled The State of Emergency. The church is in a state of emergency. So I pour out my heart to you. Let us individually seek the Lord while he may be found. And let's remember that we cannot change the direction of this nation simply by changing the leaders in Washington. We're going over a cliff. It is too late for us to think such thoughts. From my heart to yours, only God can save us now. Let us seek his face, his will, and be faithful. God bless you, and you have a good day. If you enjoyed this and would like to hear additional teaching from God's Word, please subscribe to this channel or visit our website at moodymedia.org. May God bless you richly.